Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video where we return to a topic in learning theory, namely the bias variance decomposition. And we'll see this as a useful tool, theoretical tool, also for designing new algorithms and gaining some more understanding on uh, what it uh, takes to learn and the implications of using complicated or uh, simple models. So uh, in previous videos, we took a look at uh, the VC dimension for getting some kind of grasp on um, how well we can expect that the, the model we train to minimize the ensemble error, how well it's going to perform on, on new data. In particular, we had this VC dimension bound that said that, well, if I give you a training data set, then the probability that the ensemble error of the hypothesis that your algorithm returns is further away from the outer sample error that the hypothesis returned by more than epsilon is no more than this expression over here that goes down exponentially fast with the number of training examples, but grows with the so-called VC dimension D of the uh, of the hypothesis set that we're choosing H star from. And uh, the way we proved it, or actually we, we only proved it for the finite hypothesis case, um, but if you wanted to prove this, we actually did a union bound and actually showed the following stronger claim, namely that the probability uh, over a trained data set of n training examples that even exist a single hypothesis H in the hypothesis set for which the in same layer and out same layer are more than epsilon apart is no more than this same expression that you see up here, right? So somehow we simultaneously guarantee that every single hypothesis in the hypothesis that has a close in same layer and out of same layer. Okay, and the probability again over these two statements is over the random training data set that you receive. And that's the random part in this expression. Okay, so what we're gonna look at this time is what's called the bias variance decomposition, which is, an, I guess, an alternative or our theory that can be used, I guess, together with the VC dimension. And it, it shows something else uh, that's also really interesting and that inspires some algorithms. It's a different way of bounding the outer sample error. And uh, we'll see two algorithms that are inspired by this bias variance decomposition, namely uh, bagging and random forest. So we'll see those in the next video. So in this video, we'll focus on understanding just what is this bias variance decomposition. So for, bias, for the bias variance decomposition, you typically look at another loss function than you do for uh, these VC dimension bounds that we saw before. Uh, particularly here, we're typically going to look at uh, when we have a least squared loss, right? So if you remember when we have a least squared loss, we define the outer sample error to be the expectation over new training example from some unknown distribution D of the difference between the prediction made by the hypothesis H that we've uh, trained and the unknown target function, and then you square this difference, right? So that's the uh, outer sample error when we're working with least squared loss, right? So X comes from some unknown distribution D, and the training data uh, will consist of N IID samples from the same distribution, right? That's the, the setup that we've been looking at so far. And also for least squared loss, right? The N sample error is just the average over all uh, N training examples of the difference between uh, the prediction made by H and the uh, unknown target function evaluated xi. And here, these are the labels that we receive, right? So let's assume that we have these deterministic labels, uh, if you remember the, the previous videos on, on learning theory. So, so here we just assume that we actually do receive the true labels uh, f of xi, and then the ensemble error is just the average of these squared differences. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this bias variance decomposition that we're going to see it's going to give some bounds on this outer sample error when we're working with the least squared loss. Now, the previous VC dimension bounds that we saw earlier on, they don't apply if the outer sample error is defined as the least squared loss in the regression problem. They actually crucially relies on the fact that the labels are minus one, one. Okay, so, so here it's different. And, and the interesting point is that actually this, uh, if you're doing least squared loss and you're proving something for this definition of outer sample error, you will actually get something meaningful, even if you're in a binary classification case. Because if you think about it, if you have labels zero and one only, and your predictions are also only zero and one, then the square difference here between the prediction and the true label is always exactly one whenever you mispredict, and it is zero if you predict correctly. So it actually means that this loss is equal to the zero one loss if your labels are zero one and your predictions are zero one. So, so then the theory that we have here also implies, uh, applies to, to the case with zero one labels and, and zero one loss. And okay, but normally so, so far we looked at labels in minus one plus one. And actually you can see that uh, this definition up here still, if you can prove something for this outer sample error, 
that it's small, uh, then if you have a tool for that, you'll also get something for uh, minus one plus one labels. Basically, because when I, if all my labels are minus one or plus one, and all my predictions are minus one or plus one, then whenever um, my prediction is correct, I still get a zero squared here. So that's just zero, like in the zero one loss. If my prediction is wrong, I get either one uh, minus minus one that gives me a two, or I get minus one minus plus one, which gives me a minus two. So then I square it and I get a four, which is exactly four times the zero one loss. Right? So, so this outer sample error here and this in sample error here, I actually, uh, if you constrain H and F to return either zero ones or minus one and plus ones, then it basically becomes the, the zero one loss. So things we can prove here also work the zero one loss, but but I guess the interesting thing is it also says something by general for general uh, regression problems which the previous results do not. Okay, so just to summarize, right, it, it just means that everything that we're going to do with bias and variance, all the intuition that we're going to gain, it's also going to make sense if we uh, looked at zero one losses for binary classification. Okay. <clears throat> So the learning setup again is, uh, as, as always, is that we receive n training examples from an unknown uh, distribution. And let us here call the training data set uh, D. Okay, so D is the set of examples that we've seen. They come from some unknown distribution. And then what we always do is that we run some learning algorithm on this data, and then we output a hypothesis H, right? The learning algorithm computes a hypothesis. So the idea in bias variance is, I guess, uh, as you always want to do, we want to bound the outer sample error, right? We want to say something theoretical about the outer sample error of the hypothesis we produce. And the basic idea here is to, um, which is different from before, is we, we want to take the learning algorithm into account. So, so what do we mean by that, right? So the basic idea is we want to we want to say, well, we want to bound the expectation over the data set D. So that's the training data set of n examples of the outer sample error of the hypothesis HD that the learning algorithm produces when it receives D as input, right? So, so here the learning algorithm is taking part of it because this hy concrete hypothesis that we're looking at in here is actually the one the learning algorithm outputs. Okay, so, so we're saying, well, the, we wanna bound the expectation of one new data set of the outer sample error of the hypothesis that our uh, model produce, our learning algorithm produces, okay. So basically what we want to do is we want to bound the expected outer sample error of the hypothesis that the learning algorithm produces when it's run on the random data set D. Right? So that's what we're interested in. Okay. And we'll see why that makes a good sense, but, but let's first just compare it to the VC bound. So the VC bound says the following, right? So here it's the data sets that's random. So the VC bound says with the probability over a random data set that there is even a single hypothesis uh, in the data set for which the in and out of error are more than epsilon apart is no more than this expression over here. So uh, this expression up here, the bias variance thing that we're trying to bound here, this depends on the learning algorithm right here. The output of the algorithm is actually part of the expression. Whereas down here, uh, the expression here is really independent of the algorithm. It's just saying something about if I just look at the hypotheses that I could choose from and I evaluate them on the training data set D, then these in sample errors that I will get by evaluating them on the training data set, they're very good estimates of the out sample error. Okay, so it doesn't depend on the learning algorithm, it's just a statement. So, so we'll try to focus on this, try to get an expression, uh, rewrite this expression here, the expected outer sample error of the hypothesis learned on a random data set D. And the expression that we end up with at the end uh, actually says, says something really useful about how we should, uh, how we could perhaps try to improve the performance of learning algorithms. Okay. So <clears throat> the first thing to do is if we'll just write out what this is, right? So the outer sample error of HD just by definition is the expectation of one new training example of the difference between the prediction made by HD on this example and the true label squared. Right? So that's just by definition. Okay. Now looking at this expression, the first thing we're going to do is just, we're gonna flip the order of summation or expectation here, right? So we can always do this. It's just flipping the order of, of expectation. And then let us try to look at this inner expression here. So let us 
write it out what it is, right? So we have a square in here. So we get the first term squared, and then we have the expectation of the first term squared. Uh, then we have the second term squared. We have the, actually we have to take expectation of it, but f is independent of the data set. So uh, taking expectation, it's just a constant here. So we just move it out. Finally, we have the cross term uh, hd of x times um, minus f of x, and we have two of those. So two with a minus in front, f of x. And again, the expectation, this f of x is a constant when it's, it doesn't depend on d. So we only have the expectation onto the hd of x. Okay, so, so we just expanded it. We just squared this expression and moved the expectations in wherever relevant, treating some of the terms as uh, constants. And this is just by using linearity of expectation. So now we have this expression here. Okay. So we have this term that, that appears over here on the right that says the expectation over D of HD of X. And now X is, is think of X as fixed. So let's try to get an understanding of what is this expression doing? Like what is this expectation over D of HD of X? So, so let's try to get an intuition. So, right, so there is an expectation, right? So that kind of uh, basically means that what we would what we get up here is that you you get what we, the, is the result of the following experiment, right? So think of just sampling data sets d1 up to dm. Just sample a lot of these data sets. All of them have n examples. You all sample them uh, from this unknown distribution, and you just repeatedly sample a data set. So you get a lot of data sets d1 to up to dm. And then you train a hypothesis on each of and every one of them. So let's call the one you train on the i data set HDI. Then if you average all these predictions made by these hypotheses on X, then this tends to this expectation, right? Because the expectation is just, well, I sample basically a random data set and then I look at the hypothesis I produce here and evaluate it on X. So so really, this expect that if this basically corresponds to just sampling a lot of data sets, uh, arbitrarily many more, and in the limit, if you just average the hypothesis that you get on the i, you, you train a hypothesis on each and every one of those data sets and evaluate it on x, you average all those predictions, and this tends to be this uh, expectation over d h d of x. Okay, so so in some sense, right, one can think of this. <clears throat> expectation over d h d of x as an average hypothesis right so so in some sense it's the average hypothesis over all the data sets i could get if i just sampled uh, n training examples so we'll use this notation we'll call it h bar of x to just be the hypothesis that on an x returns the expectation over a data set of h d of x and this h bar of x is the one that you would get in the limit if you just sampled enough data sets and independently and just train on every one of them and output the average of the prediction made by all these hypotheses that you train. <clears throat> so average hypothesis is what you get if you sample infinitely many uh, data sets and train a hypothesis on each and every one of them and average their outputs. Okay, so I think this requires an example just to make sure we completely grasp what this actually is. Okay, so sometimes you can actually compute this exactly like what this average hypothesis is. And now I guess I'll try to, to go through an example here where we actually compute explicitly what this average hypothesis is. So let's say, right, we're trying to learn an unknown target function. And, and I'm just telling you that this unknown target function is the function that on an element X has the label X squared minus X plus three. Okay, so it's an arbitrary choice and this is, this is one function. And now the data set that we received for training Let's say that we just received two uniform random points. So the feature, there's only one feature, right? That's an X. And they sit uniformly between minus 10 and 10. Okay. And the, this means that the point has the coordinate X1, the first point, and its label is X1 squared minus X1 plus three. And the second point has the feature X2 and the label X2 squared minus X3 plus three. And let's say the learning algorithm, which is a very natural learning algorithm, if you have just two points, is to uh, the, the the model that you're going to output, the hypothesis you're going to output is just maybe you do linear regression, find a line that passes through the two points. And whenever I want to evaluate or predict the, on, on any given X, I just return the value of this line. And to fit a line through the two data points and 
uh, whenever I want to make a new prediction, I just uh, evaluate, figure out where, where would this line be? Okay, so what's the value of the line? Okay, so so basically this is just using linear regression. That's all it is. Okay, so, so then we can ask, okay, in this setup here, our learning algorithm is linear regression. Our data consists of two uniform random points. Uh, the feature is uniform random between minus 10 and 10. And the unknown target function is this x squared minus x plus three. So in this setup, we can ask, what is this average hypothesis up here, right? What is the expectation over a data set of hd of x? So, so let's just plot what it is here. So here's the a plot of the unknown target function. It's the red curve here. This is the one we're trying to learn. And the data set is two points sampled uniformly between minus 10 and 10. So what we got here is two points on the curve. So we, we would have received the point that's sitting exactly here and the point that's sitting exactly here. And we fit a line through them, which means that, okay, if I wanted to make a prediction using this line that I've that I found, and I want to say make a prediction, I get a new data point with a feature of seven and a half, I would go up and make the prediction of what this line would say at seven and a half. Okay, so that's how I would make my predictions. So of course, right, this is going to be off from the true unknown target function, and so on. So the question we want to ask now is, what is the average hypothesis, right? What is what's going to happen here? So intuitively, the average hypothesis, right, we will pick two random points, draw a line between them. Uh, and if we repeat this in a lot of times, right, we could keep sampling two data points, drawing a line through them, sample two new points, draw a line through them. Uh, and then we're going to average the prediction that all these lines would make. What would we get? So, so maybe just to answer that, maybe let's try to find an expression for this line that we're going to, to output. We're just going to use this classic and notation for a line, y is equal to ax plus b. a is the slope, but b is the intercept or offset on the on the y-axis. So the two training examples that we that we have, right? Again, we said that the x coordinate the feature is x1 and the y coordinate is x1 squared minus x1 plus 3, and similarly for x2. So let us first compute what is the slope of uh, of this line as a function of x1 and x2. Right, so the slope is, if you remember the formula, you have to take the y-coordinate of the second point minus the y-coordinate of the first point and divide it by the x-coordinate of the second point minus the x-coordinate of the first point. That's the slope. So we get this, this expression here. And let's just simplify it a little bit. So we see that the threes, they cancel out. So the threes are gone. And then, as we made a lucky choice, we can actually see that this expression of here can be simplified a little bit. So one can actually rewrite it as x2 plus x1 minus 1 times x2 minus x1. Maybe we want to just convince ourselves that this is indeed the case. So if we multiply x2 in, we get an x2 squared corresponding to this term up here. We get an plus x2 x1 minus x2. So the minus x2 is also here. The x2 x1 is not in the expression above, but let's see that it disappears. Then we have the minus x1 that we multiply with the x2. So that cancels out the x1, x2, right? And here we have a minus x1, x2, so they cancel out. Then we have a minus x1 squared, which matches this expression here. And then we have a plus x1, which matches this expression, right? So this is just a simplification. And now we see that the second term and the denominator cancel out. So the slope of this line is just x2 plus x1 minus one. Okay. So, so that's the slope of the line as a function of x1 and x2, if it's the line that passes through these two points up here. Okay, so that's the slope and let's compute the offset of the intercept. So here we can just take, well, the first point and uh, then we realize that it has to be, uh, the intercept is well, basically the y coordinate here at x1 minus x1 times the slope. Okay, so this is just tracing the line back to, uh, to the y axis here. Okay. Now you just plug in what the slope is. We already have a formula for that. So we just plug that in and we get x1, x2 minus x1 squared plus x1. I guess it's a plus x1 that cancels out with a minus x1 and uh, a minus x1 squared canceling out with an x1 squared. So all we have left is the three minus the x1, x2. Okay, so that is the, the offset here. Okay, so a rather simple expression. So now we have an expression for the line that we get if we sample these two points. Okay, 
Now we need to know what is the average hypothesis, right? So let's try to see if we can derive this. So the average hypothesis, again, by definition, is the expectation over a data set of the prediction HD, the hypothesis that we train on this data set, makes on a given X. Now, the prediction that we make on a given X, right, we're going to get a line, right? This thing that we output here is going to be a line. So it's gonna, the prediction that it's going to make is AX plus B. And uh, just by linearity of expectation, and X is a constant here, it's expectation of A times X plus expectation of B. And here the expectation is the expectation of the slope when I draw a random data set D. Now, we have already expressions here for, for the slope and uh, the offset for this when we get a data set uh, like this. So in place of A, we can put X2 plus X1 minus one. And in place of uh, B over here, we get three minus X1 X2. Okay. Linearity of expectation allows us to move the expectation in. And three is just a constant. And then we notice, right, so X1 and X2 in this data distribution that we're looking at, they're uniform random between minus 10 and 10. So the expectation of them of a uniform random number between minus 10 and 10 is just zero. So all of these, these two terms are zero. We have this minus X left. Okay, X1 and X2 are independent data samples. So the expectation of the product is equal to the product of their expectations. And each of these terms, again, were just zero. So all that we get here is that the average hypothesis is the one that on a given X returns minus X plus three. That's the average hypothesis. Okay, so let us just try now to, uh, to see this, uh, that this is actually the case. So let's uh, have an experiment here. Uh, that that kind of visualizes this. So so let's see. Okay, so I'm going to run this code. Let's not spend too much time on the actual implementation, but let's have a look at what happens here. So two seconds. It's just running, and it generates this plot here. So what's going on here? So here the red thing here is this is still the same target function from before, the one that we have before. Each and every one of these blue lines corresponding to, I basically did this experiment where I compute a whole lot of data sets, assemble a whole lot of data sets, D1, D2, D3, D4, uh, consisting of two examples, two points. And then I draw the line through them. I just train the line through them. And you'll see, right, that all these blue lines are all the lines that you get in all these experiments that we mentioned, right? I just sample random experiments, um, draw all these lines that, that pass through them through these two data points. So, so I just sampled all these many data points. And then what I draw out here, this line that, that, that you have here is the line where uh, I basically took all those blue lines, right? They have an A and a B, and I just averaged uh, the slopes and the offsets. And then I get this average line down here. And as you can see, right, this, this average line actually has the slope of minus one. And it's offset here, if you go up, is three. So the offset set here at zero. So, so this is really, this does give us this minus X plus three that we just calculated explicitly. But all I did here in the code was just to sample a whole lot of data sets. In particular, I sample actually 1000 data sets consisting of two data points. Then I, I trained the model that just fits a line through them. And I averaged all these lines that I got here. I just averaged the, the slopes and the offsets. And this gives me this, uh, this line here. Okay. So let me go back to uh, to the slides. Okay, so if you run this experiment, you actually get, let's just scale a little bit to fit the, the screen better. If you run this experiment, you'll actually see that indeed this is the average hypothesis that we get. So this is the way to think about it, right? If I just sample data sets a lot of times, like I've done here, uh, then this h bar of x is just the average of all these hypotheses that I that I've seen. Okay. Now, okay, so back to write, bounding this expression here. So we started out by rewriting the expectation over the data set of the outer sample error of HD as this expression here. Okay. And now we looked at this single term here and saw that this is basically the average hypothesis, right? This is the average hypothesis H bar of X. Okay. So, so if we just substitute that in, right, in place of this expression, this is the average hypothesis h bar of x that we have up here. Okay, so let's keep working with this expression a bit more. 
just moved it up and let's see, try to, to rewrite it even further. So what I'm going to do now, a, a neat trick here is to add zero, but I'm going to write zero as minus the average hypothesis prediction squared plus the average hypothesis prediction squared. I'm going to add this here in the middle. So this is just adding zero. So of course it's still with equality. And now I'm going to group the terms uh, to make things simpler. Right? In particular, the last three terms here, they group together nicely. So what you see here is that the last three terms, right, is exactly h bar of x minus f of x squared, right? Because you have an h bar of x squared here, you have an uh, f of x squared here, and you have twice the cross terms. Uh, with so, so this is this simplifies this part a bit. So now we have over here, and in here I just moved it inside the the expectation over d. Okay, so I just moved it in. It's just a constant as a function of d. It doesn't depend on this d, but I can so I can just move it in. Okay, so this is uh, a new expression, a new rewriting of this uh, out of sample error, the expected out of sample error. Okay, we're going to do one last rewriting, and then we're done rewriting this uh, out of sample error. And this is we're going to focus on this first term uh, up here, in particular, we're going to look at the inner part. Right, so we're going to look at the inner part when x is fixed. So what we see is that, uh, let's try to, right, so this is the difference of the squares. What Let's try to look at the square of the difference instead and see what happens. So let's try to look at the square of the dif difference. If you look at the square of the difference, right, and then I get the square of the first term, I get the square of the second term, and I get twice the cross term, right? And uh, so again, right, this h bar does not depend on that d. So, so this is a rewriting of the expression above. Okay. Now, what do we have here, right? So if we look at this expression over here on the right, this is exactly the expression for the average hypothesis, right? The expectation of HD of X. So this is just another H bar. So now we have the first term here, the expectation of HD of X squared plus uh, H bar of X squared minus twice H bar of X squared. So it's exactly equal to uh, the expectation of the square uh, of h d of x minus the square of h bar of x, which is what we have up here. So, so basically, the square of the difference in expectation is this is the same as the difference between the squares. So that is our final substitution, and now we have this expression here. Okay, so what does this what does this mean, right? So now we did a fancy rewriting. Now we suddenly have this average hypothesis in there. Uh, what does this say, right? Does it say anything interesting? And it really does if you, if you think about what these expressions mean. So let's try to uh, stare at them a little bit and, and see what we can uh, interpret from uh, these expressions. So, so the second expression here actually has a really nice interpretation. <clears throat> if you look at it, it's really just the expectation over a random point of the square difference between the prediction made by the average hypothesis and um, the true label, right? So this is exactly the outer sample error of the average hypothesis. Right? This is really nice, right? It's, you just think of it as, oh, if I just average over all the data sets I could have gotten, that would have given me an average hypothesis. And that hypothesis has some outer sample error. And this is what we have here, the outer sample error of the average hypothesis that you get if you sample a data set and train. Okay, so this is a, uh, pretty natural uh, quantity, the performance of the average hypothesis, right? The er out of sample error of the average hypothesis we would get. And this is what is uh, called the bias, this term. Okay, so the bias is just the uh, defined to be uh, the, the out of sample error of the average hypothesis being expectation over a uh, new data, data sample X of the difference between H bar of X and the true label f of x squared. Okay. Now the second term over here actually also has a kind of natural interpretation. So what does it mean? Right. So if we look at it, what it's really measuring is uh, so again, there's a square of a difference in here of the prediction made on x. So there, this one of them is h bar of x, right? So that's the average hypothesis prediction, and the first one is the prediction made by the, uh, the the hypothesis output by the algorithm, right? So it's really measuring, in some sense, 
how far away is a, a random hypothesis trained from the average hypothesis in expectation. So, so we really try to say, okay, if I sample a random data set and that this gives me, and then I train and get a hypothesis, then this hypothesis, how close is it to the average one? Right. So this is what we call the variance, right? So in some sense, if you if all your hypotheses are super different all the time, then you have a really high variance. But if you almost always return the same hypothesis, then you have a small variance. Right. So the variance is just defined to be this expectation over the training example X, the expectation over data set D of the diff square difference between the prediction made by the hypothesis output by the learning algorithm on D and the average hypothesis output. And then you square it. And this is what is called the bias variance decomposition, right? So uh, the bias variance decomposition is just a rewriting of the expectation over a data set of the out sample error of the hypothesis produced by the learning algorithm on this data set as a sum of a bias term and a variance term. Where the bias term is the out sample error of the average hypothesis averaged over all uh, data sets uh, or sampling data sets of, uh, in examples. And the variance is I guess the expected uh, difference between the prediction made by the average hypothesis and the trained hypothesis squared. Okay, so the variance really is a measure of how wildly the learned hypothesis uh, varies on when you train, when you change the training data, right? Because it's the training data that changes you. I give you a random sample of n uh, training examples. Uh, how much does this uh, vary from the, I guess, average or expected hypothesis that you get? Okay, so, and, and the intuition is that high variance means that you're kind of prone to overfitting because you kind of, if you get a little bit different data set, you return something wildly different uh, as your predictions. Okay, and maybe one, one intuition to have in mind is that if I use a very complicated machine learning model, then I'll typically be able to drive the bias very far down. Like, so the average hypothesis is actually going to do well, but you might have high variance if you're fitting noise and stuff like this. Um, and you just get a little bit different data, then you change your model uh, a lot. Right? That's the kind of intuition to have in mind, where simple models typically have a high bias, but maybe a low variance because we cannot uh, vary the predictions that much. Okay. And one thing that is, is often the case is that the more data you have, the less the variance is. Right? You're going to zoom in on uh, a hypothesis that is actually very close to the best one, and you're going to return something that's very close to that hypothesis every time. That's kind of the intuition. Let's see one example of this, um, where we try to fit uh, the cosine function from data. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, train two different models. We're going to train a linear model using linear regression. And we're going to uh, also train the best second degree polynomial, uh, the one that fits the, the training data the best. And here we're also going to lose least squared loss in both cases. And as you saw in previous videos, one way to train such a second degree polynomial is to do, first do a feature transform of the training data, where if I get an example x comma a label, I'm gonna create the new features uh, one x x squared. And then I'm gonna do linear regression uh, with this. So this allows me to find the best second degree polynomial fit. This was also uh, covered in previous videos. We're gonna look at two different examples. We're going to look at one where the training data sets have size only two, and we're going to look at one where the training data sets have size 40. So let's uh, run those two experiments. So let me just uh, share that again and see if I can find uh, the window. Okay, so here was the experiment from before. Now let's run a new experiment here with these two models. So let's just see first what, the, what we get, and then I'll try to explain what happens. Okay, so here's the picture, and let me try to explain what's on this picture. So you have the unknown target function, which is the cosine function, right? So this is the red curve here, and we're looking just between zero and two pi. Okay, so that's where the data is. The data is un two uniform random x coordinates between zero and two pi, and then you get uh, the evaluation of the cosine function. You get x comma cosines x. And then you have two different learning models, right? One is that you compute a line through the two points. And the other one is that you compute it, it's the best second degree polynomial through the two points. <clears throat> and of course, there can be multiple, but we're just going to uh, run linear regression and, and use the one that it outputs. Okay. So what we see here is 
um, all the blue lines are basically all the lines that you get when you uh, get these two examples. I read, just ran the experiment, uh, let's see, a 1,000 times, sampling two points on the on uh, the cosine function and drawing the line through them. That gives me all these different blue lines. Okay, if I average those blue lines, I'm gonna get uh, this, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get the purple line that goes uh, horizontally here. And uh, this is the, the line that, this is the average hypothesis here. Now, instead, if I train a second degree polynomial, I get all these green uh, curves that you see up here. And if I average them, I'm gonna get this, this uh, blue or greenish uh, model that you see down here. This is the average of all these polynomials. Okay, now, which one performs the best, right? So if we look at it, since we only have two training examples, both of them get an in-sample error of zero, right? So they don't both do perfectly on the training data because there's only two points, they can both fit it. And the outer sample error that we see, so this is just the average, this outer sample error here is the average over all these experiments of the outer sample error of the model that we train. For uh, the linear models, it's 2.6. And for the uh, second degree polynomials, it's 7.38. Okay, and what do we have here? So what we also computed is this bias and the variance, right? So we can look at the expected error of the uh, average model. And you can see here that, well, uh, the, the lines have a very low bias and actually also low, very low variance. And well, the degree two polynomials are just strictly worse in this example. We could also try and run maybe with three data examples just to see what happens then. So now I'll give it three training examples instead of uh, instead of two. And let us just uh, wait for it a little bit. So, okay, so now we have three data points instead, right? And maybe one interesting thing here is that when we have three, three data points, uh, the line can no longer fit all three. So it's just a linear regression thing. So the uh, in sample error is something like 0 0.09, whereas it's basically zero for the second degree polynomials, right? This is just numerical stability issues. What you see though, is that the outer sample error of, on average over all these, these different hypotheses is actually uh, worse for the degree two polynomial fits, even though it passes through perfectly through the training data. Okay. And we can try to look at what is the bias and what is the variance. So down here, right, the, the average uh, model that we get from uh, the degree two polynomials is, is this actually really nice curve that kind of looks quite a lot like the unknown target function, the cosine function. Whereas the average model for the lines is just flat like this. And what you'll see here is that, that the bias now is much smaller for the degree two polynomials, right? It's, it's significantly smaller than uh, for the, the lines. You can also see that it looks much more like the unknown target function. The issue is that the variance of this uh, hypothesis that we produce is, is much higher for degree two polynomials. And well, the outer sample error is the sum of the bias and the variance. That's the expected outer sample error. And you can see if we sum these two values up, we get this uh, outer sample error here. Okay. So this, this is where kind of visualization of the bias and the variance where you can see that, well, I guess these, these green curves, you can see they go way out of the picture down here. So, so somehow they vary more compared to uh, their average hypothesis than, than the lines do. Okay, let's finally run an experiment where we give it a lot more training data. Let's say we give it uh, 40 training examples instead of just three. And this is basically, we have more data and you can see here, okay, in this case, it starts to look much nicer also for the, um, the the more complicated model here, right? So again, right, the, the red curve is the unknown target function. The blue ones are all the lines that we fit through two points. So they've been fit through two, two rand, uh, 40 points, sorry, we do a linear regression with 40 points. And uh, the blue, uh, the green curves here are all the second degree polynomial fits to, to 40 data points. And we get here again, we see that, that the average model is pretty much the same as before, right? It's, it's very close to this unknown target function, but the variance, right? All the green models that we train are much closer to this average one that they, than they were before. We can also see, right, that the outer sample area here we get, becomes really small, right? So given enough data, both the bias and the variance of this uh, second degree um, 
polynomial actually uh, does really, really well. Okay, so, so this was kind of the illustration of uh, what is this average model? What should we really think of it as? And uh, what is the bias and what is the variance, right? The variance is really how far wildly do these models vary from this average one. So let me go back to the slides to finish up. So, so really, right, the, the, the picture that we get uh, depends on how much training data we have and how complicated the models are. Uh, but we really, it always depends on this average model, right, that we saw in these different pictures, right? We have different average models, the average of all the training examples, and then, then the bias term is really how well does this average model perform? How close is it to the unknown target function? And the variance is really, well, all these other models that we train, if we train a random model, how close is it to this average model? And you can see here with more data, they come closer to the average model. Okay, so basically, if you want to use this bias variance decomposition for anything interesting, if I want to use it to improve learning, then that I guess the two things you could try, right? You can either try to reduce the bias or to reduce the variance without increasing the other, right? It is generally, it's hard to do much about the bias. Uh, as you can, I guess you can, you saw in the previous example already with uh, three examples, the second degree fit uh, was actually pretty close to the unknown target function. It basically depends, the bias mostly depends on the complexity of the model as long as you have an, a natural learning algorithm. But the thing that you could try to do uh, something about is this variance in particular. And this is where we'll see a couple of algorithms that uh, tries to reduce the variance and, and thereby uh, make better predictions. And the variance was this expression here, right? That the it's the expectation over a, a data point, the expectation over a model uh, trained on a data set D of the difference between the prediction of the average a model that you train and the one that you get on D, the square of that difference. So in the intuition, if you stare at this expression is that, well, what I wanna do or what I wanna have is that there should be more stability in the hypothesis I return, right? The hypothesis I return should always be kind of close to an, the average hypothesis, right? You kind of prefer the picture down here when they're all very close to this average hypothesis. And this is what we'll see uh, some techniques for doing in, in the next video.